What warning does Jesus give to his apostles now that his time on earth is coming to an end? That's what we're going to talk about today in Matthew 24. So as he left every night, he went over to Bethany. And as they were leaving, the apostles were pointing out some buildings at the temple area. And he says, you see all those? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Meaning they're all standing up in a building. And these stones were big. I mean, I think they were as tall as I was. So they were big blocks. But he's telling them, you know what? At some point, this is not going to stand anymore. And at some point I heard, you know, when they talk about the temple, he, sometimes he's talking about himself. But I think at this point he is telling them this temple is coming to an end, which is hard to believe because Herod, you know, in four, who died in 4 BC, you know, some 30 years ago, just rebuilt this thing. I mean, these buildings stayed up for a thousand years. And now in this very short period of time, this building is not going to have one stone standing upon another. He sat on the Mount of Olives. This is, again, an olive grove that's across the, the valley from the temple. So when you're sitting there, you would be able to see the temple. You'd be able to see the place where the devil took and tempted him to throw himself down. You would see all the activities and everything that was going on. And this is supposed to be a temple of God. And Jesus sees all the things that are very ungodly that was going on. The disciples came to him and said, tell us. Are these things that you're saying, are, they gonna, are there signs of your coming or the end of the age? And boy, now we're going to get into the end of the age. Who decided to do this podcast in the first place? This stuff starts to get hard. So he says, don't let anyone lead you astray. A lot of people are going to come in my name. And they'll say, I'm the Christ. And he will, they'll lead people off. I mean, even the fact that there were still some followers of John the Baptist 200 years after John was dead, but not followers of Jesus. I mean, that's weird, right? People follow the wrong people. And he says that you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. This is ESV. And that you shouldn't be scared about this. These things have to take place, but it won't be the end yet. And he says that nations are going to rise up by nations and kingdoms against kingdoms and famines and earthquakes. But these are the birth pangs. Wow. So I've heard all this before, you know, I've heard people mention this about it. And someone brought up this interesting point that while there was war, you know, at this time of Jesus and before the time of Jesus, you didn't have all the nations rising up against all the nations. The, the concept of world war or many nations involved in battles. I mean, you had these weird things like the Assyrians were trying to take over and this other group would try to fight them. Or when the Greeks came in, the Jews built an alliance with the Parthians, which was another big empire trying to drive them off. So you might have coalitions, but nation against nation, that wasn't a concept. That's not something I think we really saw until World War I, where you had many nations going against many nations. So this is scary talk, but he calls them birth pangs. And I think that's such an interesting phrase, because if you've ever watched TV shows where women give birth, I've not given birth. I haven't had children, but they look pretty rough. They, you could tell this is painful. This is a lot of work. They're exhausted. Everyone's trying to be super nice and help them out. And you need it because you don't get a baby without the birth pangs, right? And he's saying, look, all this is going to be ugly. This is going to be a bad time, but this has to happen because this is the birth pangs. This is a beginning, not an end. And he said, they're going to deliver you to tribulation and put you to death. You're going to be hated by all nations. And, that, and that's not just the apostles. This is going to be all Christians. We see it. I mean, I saw a statistic of how many Christians, I think so far this year, 230 Christians have been killed for their faith so far. And you don't hear about it much, right? You don't hear in the news how many times that happens. Truth of the matter is, is that People being injured, murdered for their faith, shot up in churches, you know, or brought to jail in other countries because you're not allowed to be a Christian in other countries. That's happening. And it has been happening. He says that the lawlessness will increase. But this is a sad term. The love of many will grow cold. And I think you see that where there's no more compassion. You know, when you can sit there and kill someone 
and cold blood and think it's funny. That is the love gone cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So he's saying, you know, this temple is coming to an end, and it does. In 70 AD, the Romans, after a revolt, slaughter a bunch of Jewish people in Jerusalem, enslave and haul off to other places, decimate and destroy Jerusalem. And this is years. You know, they they think that Mark was maybe written in 65 AD. This happened in 70 AD. There is some conversation, you know, the people say, oh, well, you know, the Old New Testament, it was written 150 years after Jesus, you know, giving some year. And now we have more evidence that that's not true. In fact, that, that there were writings contemporary with the apostles' lives. But if you think it was written afterwards, you think they would have mentioned that Jesus said the temple was going to be destroyed. And sure enough, in 70 AD, that totally happened. They would have said it. And they don't say it because they're using the apostles' words before that happened, because it would have been an important part at this point, a footnote of Matthew, to say, oh, and that happened, by the way. To give you some thoughts about, you know, temple, is that Solomon's temple was built, and after his temple was destroyed, Ezra and Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple in Ezra 615. Then Herod the Great made it much cooler and better, because he was Herod the Builder, Josephus said that it took over 10,000 men to work on it for eight years to do all the work that they did, and that this temple exceeded the, the temple that was built by Solomon, which was very impressive. Herod's work, they said, was about 500 yards long and 400 yards wide. So if a football field is 100 yards, think about it that way. And the rebuilding started in around 19 BC and was completed only in 63 AD. And then seven years later, the whole thing comes down. So this is a big deal. And it's the heart of the people. The people wanted the temple to worship God and wanted a place that they felt God lived in that temple. And Jesus is going to tell us where God is going to live after this point, because now we won't need any temples. And he said that when you see this awful thing happened, and he indicates as part of the prophecy of Daniel, people will flee to the mountains. Again, people lived in the wilderness. The Dead Sea Scrolls were put into caves to protect them from the Roman siege so that if they get killed, at least the message of God goes on. But this is also the very famous passage where he says, and for the women who are pregnant and nursing infants, Pray that it doesn't happen in winter or on Sabbath and because all these horrible things are going to happen. You should be prepared. It's going to be terrible for people who are vulnerable. He says that if all these things don't happen, if this was all cut short, why not just spare all of this? I mean, isn't that what the devil was promising Jesus when he said, I'll give you all the power? Let's just cut this short, which is the exact word of what Jesus is saying. But if we don't, then no one would be saved. This all has to happen. And if anyone says, you know, look, there's the Christ, there's Messiah. He's over here. He's over there. There's going to be false prophets. Don't let your people get led astray. I've told you before, if you hear people saying it, and he says, if if they say, oh, he's out in the wilderness, don't go looking for him. Don't believe it. People are going to try to lead you astray because when he comes back, it's going to be lightning from the east shining in the west. The Son of Man will be something everybody sees at the same time. It's not going to be him in this room on this road. When he comes for the second time, we will all know. So this is a very important part. You know, again, it gets very heavy about this. And again, we know this is the birth pang. This is going to bring into the new kingdom. And like I said, I went out to Megiddo. And Megiddo is, it's it's, Har means mountain. So it's Har Megiddo or Armageddon. It's where we get the concept of Armageddon. This was going to be the final battle place. I guess it's the way the archaeological dig explained it to us is that this is at a crossroad of many nations. And so if there were going to be conflicts, it was going to be in this area. Everyone was goofing around and thinking it was funny that they were at Armageddon. And I just kind of stood there. It was a really 
weird thing where the wind was coming off the planes and it was quiet and creepy. And I'm not a Christian. I'm like, I'm getting chills. I mean, not like chills from the wind, but this is creeping me out. You can see that idea here is that the apostles must have just been shocked about what is about to happen to them. And at the time, I, when I was in Jerusalem, they said that over, I forgot, the life of Jesus, there were over 80 people that were claiming to be the Messiah. But what's different about them compared to what's different about Jesus? Because that was my question. Well, how come there's 80? Why was Jesus any more special than the rest of the 79 who were there at the time? Apparently, there's a lot of people there. And they said, well, that was because the rest of them ended up dead and in tombs. They had bodies. They were killed. They didn't come back. And Jesus was different in that way. And this was a Jewish person telling me. So I was like, oh, okay. And even this is one of the commentaries I was reading. There's been many times. In fact, I read a book called The History of the End of the World. And it was primarily about Christians who thought the end of the world was happening. Some of it was, you know, in 1846, a guy named William Miller thought that through his math and figured out the end of the world is going to be in 1846, except it didn't happen. And so this book talked about World War I. I mean, like I said, no one thought of world wars. And so finally, when you get a world war, you think, oh, this is it. This is the end. Oh, well, then there was World War II. Then you see the uh, absolute cruelty to mankind in World War II. You think this has to be the end. This is so awful. You heard people, too, in the pandemic think, is this the end? You know, is this the time we've heard about? So we think we know when it's coming, but we don't. And so this is where Jesus is saying, like, don't fall for traps. I'm not standing over in the cornfield. I'm not going to be over in this building. I'm not going to be here or there. When I come back again, y'all are going to see me in the sky like lightning. And then he comes and says that in those days, the sun will darken, the moon will not give light, and the stars will fall from heaven. Is this parable? Are stars going to fall from heaven? Or is it just meaning that it is going to be so black outside? It's going to be so dark outside. You're just not even going to see them anymore. Heaven will be shaken. And the signs of the Son of Man to all the tribes of the earth will mourn and then see the Son of Man coming down in a cloud of heaven with power and great glory. The angels will come out with a loud trumpet. And it says he'll gather his elect from the four winds, from every part of the earth and to heaven and the other. So then he talks about the fig tree again. And the fig tree now, before we had to curse the fig tree, it wasn't living up to its purpose. It wasn't producing fruit. But now it's going to have branches and it's going to put out leaves. And that means summer is near. So when you see these things, you'll know too, this is coming near. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about these things. And he says, now this is the part that confuses everyone. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So he says, well, what do you mean this generation? He's not talking about this generation, these group of people. He's not talking about the times before the apostles will die. He's talking about that all of us are not going to pass away. This generation, meaning this group of people, This era of time is not going to end without these things happening. He lets us know that even if all these horrible things are happening, summer will soon be here. Don't give up hope. People want to know when. When is this going to happen? And he says, the angels don't know. The son, Jesus doesn't know. Only the father knows. And he compares it to the time of Moses, where people were cavorting. They were acting sinfully. They were just going about their day-to-day lives. Meanwhile, Noah's over there building an ark, and they're making fun of him. They're joking about him. They're not paying attention because Noah would have saved anybody, but they didn't care. And so they were so unaware of what was going on around them, they got swept away by the waters. And he says, that's what it's going to be like, too. There are going to be people in the field and doing their day-to-day jobs. So he says... And this is where it gets up. It says, two men will be in the field and one will be taken, one will be left. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But then he just says, stay awake, pay attention. Your Lord is coming. But know that it's like a thief in the night. You know, so you always think about the thief in the night, right? 
So you're living in your house and you hear a noise downstairs and you don't pay attention to it. The thief came in, did his thing, did his thieving thing and went out and you didn't even know what happened. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be at a time you don't expect. It's going to be at a moment you don't expect. So that's where you have to just remain faithful. Don't worry about the time. Don't be like that guy in 1846 that used math to predict it. You should always be prepared. You should always be ready. And then he gives an analogy. And I always like this about the servant, you know, who like leaves his uh, servants in charge of everything. And there are going to be some servants who are going to get drunk. They're going to screw around. They're going to eat and drink and not be prepared for when the master comes back. You ever do that? Like when your parents would go out like on date night and you would just sit there and not go to bed and you would eat all the snacks. And then when the parents came home, there you were sitting on the couch eating snacks and not doing the right thing. Oh, is that just me? Okay. Well, anyway, that's what he's saying about be the good servant who is always prepared for his master to come back home and find everything in order. And then there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We should always be prepared. We should always be ready for the end. I was told a phrase when I first became a Christian is pretend like Jesus lived yesterday, died today, and is coming back tomorrow. That we should always be prepared and not get obsessed about whether or not the end is tomorrow, next year, next month. And that's where I was saying, you know, this whole passage, a lot of people will talk about and use other passages in the Bible to talk about premillennialism and postmillennialism. Is there going to be a thousand years? Is it going to be a rapture? Is it the thousand years right now? And there is no additional thousand years? I mean, I am not going to get into that. Believe me, that is something that you should share with your pastor. But yet people getting obsessed about this. And I always joke, I'm a panmillennialist. I think it's going to pan out in the end. It doesn't matter to me what happens in the end. It doesn't matter to me when it happens. I believe this pans out. I believe that we should always be prepared, always be prepared, meaning that we give people help, mercy, love, compassion, forgiveness all the time, because we don't know when our life will end, their life will end, or the whole end of everything will end. But he is telling them, basically, his apostles, there's two parts of this. You're going to be tortured. Bad things are going to happen to you, and this temple's coming down. But in the long run, the birth pangs will come. The new world will be born. This all has to happen. Don't worry about when. Don't worry about where, because this is all going to be fine. And summer will be coming soon. So my meditation for this week is thinking about how I can be mentally prepared for the coming of Jesus all the time and coming up with maybe a better structure for my life. You know, a, a time when I pray. And a time when I meditate, I'm studying the Bible because this is a podcast and this is a lot. So studying is fine. But, you know, can I be more regular about it? Because what happens when I have those days where I forget to pray? (laughs) Then I forget to think about things of God. And what if it happens that day? Could I be a little bit more regular about it so that I'm always prepared? And so what I'm going to pray about is not worrying about the end of times. I think that when you read stuff like this, especially when I went to Harmageddo and I stood there at the last battlefield, it still makes me shudder in my brain. And so when I think about this, it's frightening. And I think we should not be frightened. God is telling us that while this is a birth pang, the next thing that's coming is going to be amazing. Don't be worried about this. Just be of help to everybody. What I'm going to share, so I think I should share with my pastor about what it is we believe about the end of the world. I know we're not uh, rapture people and we're not uh, thinking that there's going to be a thousand years, but I am a little bit fuzzy about what is going to happen. So that's probably a good thing to share with my pastors. I think it's a good thing for you to share with your pastor to find out what it is that you guys believe in your church and in your place. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. These times of tribulations and the stories of the Bible are frightening for sure. So I hope you pray to God so that you can get a piece about it. Remember, you can always email me. I will be happy to pray for you. I am Jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.